Okay, everybody, so please, uh, we're going to start the last panel uh, today, uh, bef the last panel before the film, uh, which is the panel on uh, disinformation uh, and uh, looking at the situation, the hybrid war, and we have an excellent uh, panel of experts here today, so I'm very happy to introduce them. Unfortunately, we don't have an uh, incredibly amount of, amount of time, since we do want to have time to be able to screen the film, um, which will take place right after our discussion here. As we, as you have seen, we've already arranged the room for the for the screening. So uh, I would like to start off by introducing our first speaker, who is going to give us an overview uh, of the situation, um, especially in Ukraine, uh, when we talk about disinformation and particularly the struggles that Ukraine has in, in terms of fighting with uh, Russian propaganda and disinformation uh, inside and outside uh, the country. And so our first speaker is uh, Mr. Artem Bidenko, who is the Under Secretary of State in the Ministry of Information Policy of Ukraine. Uh, very, very important position uh, to have uh, in these very challenging times. So. Thank you. Uh, I'll speak in Ukrainian. I thank the organizers for inviting me and uh, for the opportunity to participate in this uh, gathering. I will try to be brief and uh, I think uh, my responses to questions will be more uh, informative than the introductory statement. So I'd like to uh, raise two points which define the situation. First, uh, a couple of days ago, uh, the foreign minister, Mr. Klinkin, uh, has pointed at it that Russia is currently conducting a um, disinformation, fake news, uh, or distorting uh, campaign uh, worldwide. With 4Ds, uh, distorting, dismaying, disinformation. Uh, and we uh, have uh, fake news, fake media, fake events fake export. Based on these four elements, uh, using the four Ds which uh, the minister mentioned, uh, Russia today is a key uh, state which is trying to change uh, the world order and change the discourse, the narrative uh, which uh, informs the public. Uh, Countries uh, of uh, Russia's neighborhood, like uh, Poland, uh, Belarus, Ukraine, uh, feel that very strongly. Uh, real information is replaced with fakes. Um, real experts meet uh, fake experts. And uh, just because uh, they are turned into celebrities by the media, they gain uh, the status of experts. How to uh, counteract this? It's difficult. We need a lot of time, uh, not years, but decades uh, to succeed. Uh, for us, as the Ministry of Information Policy of Ukraine, we are interested to hear uh, the views of uh, real experts, uh, which could be helpful for us in conducting our policy. We believe that the best response to propaganda is truth, which is not uh, just uh, wishful uh, stories, but uh, true stories by the media. A point which introduces the debate. Ideally, I'd now like to uh, bring the microphone uh, to, uh, to, you, uh, to Yevhan uh, and to ask him, to explain the role of information warfare within the wider concept of hybrid warfare and to say something about its reality. Thank you. Thank you. I will try to remember not only about the war, but also about the 
I will uh, talk not only about the war, but also about revolution, because these two forms of human activity uh, function uh, most frequently today in the information space. Uh, the revolution of 2014 not only changed Ukraine, but also it provoked the Russian strategy of indirect action. Uh, the dynamic uh, build-up of uh, Russian and pro-Russian organizations in the east and south of Ukraine took place during Yushchenko's presidency and not under Yanukovych. The revolution of dignity, of national pride, left uh, uh, behind it uh, the uh, active phase of Russian aggression. A military intervention in Ukraine led to the situation whereby uh, Ukraine arrived at a point of no return. So yesterday's forces are not the threat today, but populism and uh, Europe-wide uh, interference by Russia in elections, which we observe in other parts of the world. Let me note uh, the paradox that the democratic uh, order uh, gives the opportunity for the application of hybrid influence method. Uh, this gives broad opportunities uh, to Russia, which uh, exploits uh, the lessons of uh, democracy from the 1990s received uh, via the United States and the European Union and uh, they take advantage of uh, democratic uh, procedures in its own interest. We observe this in the Netherlands uh, during the referendum on uh, the association agreement with Ukraine and the, in the US uh, during the presidential elections. Most of us here uh, represent uh, countries of Central and Eastern Europe interested in the fate of our region. Uh, I can make a simple comparison. A Russian is like a maniac doctor who has uh, the history of um, illnesses uh, of our uh, states, not only from the communist times, but also from the times of the Russian Empire and they take advantage uh, of uh, uh, the, uh, the divisions and the different uh, stories of the patients uh, to uh, play them off against each other. For example, the visit by Patriarch uh, Kirill uh, to Bulgaria, uh, which is perceived as a pro-Russian country. But uh, that visit uh, triggered a political explosion. Who, who could foresee that Kiri would be called the uh, cigarette um, bishop? So this demonstrates that the struggle of Bulgaria to uh, liberate itself from the Turkish yoke is exploited today by Russian uh, propaganda. Uh, we observe such a tendency uh, also in the European Union, where there will be those uh, who will seek agreement with Putin because business is uh, foremost for them. But we have the right to oppose this and to claim that this is bad. But uh, what is important is how we deliver information. Uh, we cannot stop uh, fake news. Uh, the development of uh, information uh, technology and its pace uh, doesn't allow us to stop fake. We need strategic communications at the level of uh, governments of states 
and we need uh, to be well informed about our own history and the relations between states and nations. And we should eliminate gray zones in relations between nations, states, and regions. That's the most effective uh, counteraction against fakes. But today, uh, we observe that no one uh, can be protected against hybrid attacks. Uh, the poisoning of Mr. Skripal uh, confirms this. The scandal around uh, uh, Nadia Savchenko shows uh, it's not the particular persons uh, that matter here, but the institutions. Western democracies will be seeking a response uh, to the Russian hybrid uh, impact. Ukraine has a significant uh, experience of um, a hybrid uh, conflict with Russia, and we are ready to share this. Uh, for the whole world, there is just one solution, a revolution which would enable us um, to oppose uh, these threats. Uh, his most recent book is actually called uh, How, What are the Lessons for Europe? So there are a lot of lessons that uh, can come out of Ukraine, not just for Ukrainians, but, uh, but actually for a much wider application. And um, so maybe we can turn it to um, Maria uh, Gorska, who is a journalist with Espresso TV. She's the director of the programming, also a TV show host. Um, and maybe you could speak more about this fighting the fake news um, and the experience as a journalist uh, that you have. Дякую. Ви знаєте, я думаю, що про фейк ньюс якраз найбільше може розповісти Євген Магда. Я думаю. I will uh, speak about this and uh, so-called post-truth or after-truth, which we observe um, everywhere. Focusing on the situation in Ukraine and the information society, I'm working in uh, working in journalism. Maybe I understand it reasonably well. I started my career in an entertainment uh, television uh, as the editor of uh, major uh, entertainment channels. Uh, and when Yanukovych took over um, uh, government, I decided uh, to change my job. Uh, I didn't start from scratch, but uh, I uh, started working for an opposition channel, and I don't regret it, because after some time there were uh, major changes in the country uh, in which I was able to participate, such as Euromaidan. And uh, I was able also uh, to observe this uh, with the camera, inviting uh, key um, speakers, uh, talking to them, interviewing them. Uh, and at the time, it was quite uh, risky because uh, there was censorship and pressure of government. Yanukovych uh, didn't like journalists, and any time we could be expelled from the studio, thrown out, beaten up, uh, the mm, uh, program could be uh, interrupted. Today, we have no censorship, and I can uh, say it with conviction and responsibly, but uh, today we have other challenges. We should note uh, the uh, large amount of uh, Russian programs uh, on the media, which were always present in Ukrainian media. Also in uh, recent times, uh, there is a lot of it too. Uh, so fighting the Russian uh, propaganda is important. and. Uh, this was one of the keys which allowed Putin to conduct the aggression against our territory uh, on, the uh, on the Crimea and the Donbass. 
Nikola Kniażycki, um, Ukrainian uh, deputy, um, drafted the law which uh, allowed to block Russian uh, propaganda on television and in uh, cinema, uh, leading to the production of uh, Ukrainian uh, media. But uh, I'd like to say that uh, the entertainment television uh, where I was starting my career is practically dead and uh, it is being reformed. Our media are full of politicians and political talk shows where populistic views and information uh, are blurring the picture uh, broadcast on television. It is a, a very Ukrainian phenomenon, and uh, the formula of these talk shows are very simple. They simply generate uh, huge uh, viewer um, audiences. A society which uh, has experienced Maidan expect a prompt reaction, uh, prompt results uh, from politicians. So uh, politicians become uh, TV stars. Uh, we shouldn't allow this. It is a challenge for Ukrainian uh, television to provide an alternative to such products. Very nicely to the question of the sort of lessons for the West from the kind of things you've just been describing, uh, from the information war that's going to be waged uh, on Ukraine. And at this point, I'd like to ask uh, Katarina Kruk to come in. Uh, Katya is a civil activist of distinction who who's currently a fellow of the European Values uh, Think Tank Kremlin Watch program. And it's, as always, a pleasure to welcome you back to Natalina as one of our uh, alumna, Katya. I'm so proud of alumna of College of Europe and Natalie. So thank you very much for your question. And just before answering that, I would like to come back to very two very brief points that we've touched upon during our previous conversations and our previous panels. Um, first of all, the education law, the reform on, of education that was very widely and very actively discussed during the previous panel. And uh, I would just simply remind that the very first ones who brought up the issue that minority languages uh, schools will be closed up in Ukraine and there was, will be no possibility of uh, studying or teaching in the language of national minorities in Ukraine, this was the product of Russian propaganda. And uh, the surprising case of like, the level of the problem that we are talking about, that uh, when it came to the situation when the Minister of Education of Ukraine, together with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, have traveled to Budapest in order to talk to their counterparts in Hungary, the very first thing that they needed to bring is a translation of Ukrainian legislature and to show them that the narratives and the topics that were discussed for almost several weeks in Hungarian media and Russian media actually has nothing to do with the reality. So, uh, this shows us how uh, Russian interference into the informational space and the security space of different countries, on which high levels uh, it is, and how, it's, how important it is. Another very brief point that I would like to introduce and to remind is that, unfortunately, yesterday when we were talking about the annexation of Crimea, we forgot very important informational element of the annexation and of so-called takeover operation. Uh, in 2016, the uh, Ex NATO Excellence Center in Riga has prepared a report um, which, which was started in Russian informational campaigns in Ukraine. And when they were analyzing the takeover operation of Crimea, they found out that the informational element was central to the operation of takeover of Crimea. The military element and all other elements that were taking place on the ground were supportive ones. And that is why the takeover of Crimea is one of the operations. It's almost like the textbook example of the operation, a military operation of the, um, of the modern type. When information, when uh, cyberspace, when media space, when working with narrative with fears and topics for different people takes, a uh, takes central stage. So therefore, it brings us really very smoothly to the topic of our discussion. Why are we talking about informational warfare? Why it is so important? It is so important because Russians uh, are meddling into the domestic affairs of other countries. 
fake news and information warfare is nothing different but just trying to influence the domestic society of, of given certain country. Exploiting the differences, exploiting weaknesses and trying to persuade or make people think or behave the way Russia wants to. Why it is so problematic? Because take every single example from your own life experience. When you're making decision, when you're about to make a decision about certain situation in your life, uh, you're making those decisions based on facts, based on presumptions, and so on and so forth. This is what Russia is doing. It is interfering on the basis, on the level of facts, on the level of information, meaning it is polluting the informational space around you that in the end of the day you aren't able to make any kind of well-informed decision because you were informed wrongly. So you are basing your decision on the wrong assumptions and wrong grounds. And when it comes to informational warfare and uh, the very active stage which is taken on internet with trolls and dissemination of the fake news and dissemination of fake narratives or Kremlin-produced narratives, this is exactly why it is so important and why it is so dangerous. Because suddenly um, there is a sphere that is invisible because it's very easy to see there is aggression when you see tanks on your soil or you see the shelling on the ground. The informational space is invisible and it always remains an open question whether it's a troll or maybe this is just a person with a certain point of view. And that is why the very first issue when it comes to the informational warfare and protecting our countries is about raising awareness. And this is why, this is when I jump into Ukrainian case and naming my, uh, my main thesis of my very brief speech, that Ukraine is central uh, to Western countries' victory in informational warfare. Because Ukraine so far has already four years of very active informational warfare. It was already very much present even before Maidan, even before um, the Russian annexation of Crimea and invasion of Ukraine. And it was really very briefly, uh, very beautifully discussed during our previous panel when we were discussing Ukrainian identities, how Russians were trying to influence the way Ukrainians build their identity and the way we see ourselves. Um, so Ukrainian experience in the last four years show the entire plethora of options that Russians have in their hands. Because in most of the cases when we talk about information warfare, we mistakenly might only think about fake news or maybe just trolls on the internet. First and foremost, one of the most dangerous elements of information warfare is cyber aspect, is espionage, is stealing data, is getting into the systems of different countries, uh, stealing um, private data from citizens or from the governments, distorting the infrastructure and the critical infrastructure of certain states. The second element is obviously uh, the information and use that we're talking about and uh, dissemination of false narratives. But also very important uh, aspect that we very, very briefly very very strongly see in, in European countries is the way Russia is supporting the radical and um, minor, um, minorities, radical groups and everyone who is not in the, let's say so, in, in not in the stream of the public discussion. They also support groups and, um, and parties who are trying to contest um, and put into question mark what is the current uh, agenda of the government or the direction of the development of the country. And the last aspect, which is really very much important, is the support of so-called think tanks, so-called experts and different conferences, which are simply used as a platform uh, for dissemination of the, of the propaganda and of the narratives. And very briefly, just three last points of basically the lessons of Ukraine uh, of withstanding and uh, trying to protect its informational space against Russian propaganda. And this is indeed very critical because uh, I do work in this field for already several years and in last years the most of the meetings I have aren't with politicians or journalists or even think tankers of Western countries, it's with military staff and people who are working in milit militaries, uh, ministers of defense, because they do understand that what Russia is doing right now is nothing else but the KGB style psychological operations, which are simply are being conducted on the new realm of internet, of television, and so on and so forth. So what Ukraine is is right now for Western countries is part of the solution for the problem because Western countries don't have to wait till Russia will use all of the instruments of innovation and warfare on their, on, on their ground, on their soil. They can look into Ukrainian experience and prepare. And the first uh, very important lesson is that information warfare and information security should be codified into the security documents 
of the given country. So it should be perceived as not the thing that journalists had to take care of with uh, activists or experts. This is something that also has to do with uh, the security issues of the country, meaning the, some, the work that should be done by the Ministry of Defense and also by the security services of a given country. Um, the second aspect is that while talking about informational warfare, we shouldn't be talking about Russia all the time because Already taken into Ukrainian, looking into Ukrainian experience, Russians have shown several, several methods of waging informational campaigns, and unfortunately, they were very successfully picked up by Ukrainian politicians. When we already see troll farms, which are being produced by Ukrainian politicians who are trying to disseminate their program views, their party lines, and so on and so forth. So when we're talking about informational security as such, we need to invest in our own people. We need to invest into critical thinking, in culture, in language, because this is the strongest protection. Yevhen was really very, very right when he pointed out that it is impossible to fight with fake news or it is impossible to fight with fake trolls. So at the end of the day, the battle line and the, f the front line of the, of the combating with uh, Russian propaganda and information war is the citizen itself. So our citizens and our people should be very much aware of that what they're writing uh, in internet, what they're reading in internet, or what they're seeing on television shouldn't be taken for granted and shouldn't be perceived as the ultimate truth. There always should be this, uh, this certain level of, um, of taking into under, uh, under the question mark. And the last very, very brief question, and this is something that uh, Mr. Bidenko from Minister of, Inf uh, of Information Polit Policies in Ukraine, uh, I think would very much agree, is that it is impossible to wage information warfare, it is impossible to restore informational security of a certain country if it's not done in strict and very close cooperation between state ins uh, institutions and civil society. Uh, this was one of the mistakes we briefly as Ukrainians made when we thought that, well, we don't want to work with state infrastructure, we don't want to work with state institutions because they are state, they're always bad, and they also have their own propaganda. If we're talking about information warfare, if, if we're talking about the very big enemy who is disseminating its narratives and distorting our peaceful lives and our security uh, in informational space and really exploiting our weakness, weaknesses, uh, then we have to realize that we should work together as state, as journalists, and as media outlets, as experts, and also as activists. Thank you very much, you. Katarina. Very concise and um, full of information which covers, I think, uh, at least begins to cover the whole, uh, whole spectrum of what we're dealing with here. So I want to move now to Taras Kujo, who um, many of you know, an expert on Ukraine, nationalism, Russia, has a, a recent book out as well, um, and Taras, maybe uh, I'd like to ask for your take, uh, maybe just weigh in on the discussion that's been uh, taking place so far. But one of the things that has come out is that we cannot fight uh, fake information, we cannot fight disinformation with, with, uh, with more fake information, we need to fight it with truth. But this is very challenging to do, um, and it's very challenging to prove the sources of where the fakes and disinformation are originating from. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it's loose associations and insinuations. So how do we respond uh, to all of these different types of um, information tactics? Yeah, I, I'll, I will certainly uh, look at this. But first of all, I think we need to stress that information warfare kills people. It leads to torture, it leads to abuse of human rights, um, it leads to uh, tr uh, uh, torture of uh, Ukrainian prisoners of war, and of course executions of Ukrainian soldiers because they're fascists, they're not humans. Um, and so information warfare isn't just about things which are written or said. It's also lead, it has consequences. A friend of mine, a journalist, Yuri Lukanov, went to the Crimea in March 2014, and the extent of the paranoia was incredible. They, they were under the assumption that private sector was coming in tanks, airplanes, ships, you name it, that the private sector had maybe five divisions of troops, um, when this is a couple of hundred people. So this is the extent of how the as it were, the population is softened up before the troops go in. Um, oh, sorry, microphone, okay. I thought, my wife always complains I talk too loud. Uh, um, she's not in the room though, right. Um, anyway, I'd like to look at various things, um, but particularly uh, what's I think important is that um, there's been a lot published in the West in the last four years, um, particularly by think tanks, but not only by think tanks in the West, um, into the whole realm of hybrid warfare, cyber, hacking, assassinations, you name it. 
Um, a lot of this has been published. It's like a new phenomena. The big problem with this, a lot of these publications by Western think tanks, by NATO and elsewhere, is that it's, it's as though it's assuming that everything began in 2014, which is wrong. Another wrong assumption is that uh, largely it, uh, Western depictions of the war in Ukraine tend to not deal with the fact it's a national identity question. This is the main argument of my book. It's a minority position in the West. That viewpoint, not in this room, I don't think. But in the West, the view that this is a conflict over national identity is largely a minority viewpoint. And that leads to the wrong, not really looking at the evidence. And the evidence is that this information warfare, Ukrainophobia, if you want to put it that way, has a long history, going back even centuries. Before we had Bandera, we had Mazepa. We had Petlura. We had bourgeois nationalists in the Soviet Union, Zionists. Um, agents of the CIA and such like. So it's basically all the same thing. If you don't agree with the Russian position, you're vilified in some way, um, and bourgeois nationalist, fascist, Nazi, agent of the Israeli or American CIA. Um, and then the other group of people are good people. They're the little Russians who agree with the Russian position. So that's the way. And it doesn't matter on your ideology. Ivan Juba in the 1960s was a national communist, but he was a nationalist. He was a bourgeois nationalist because he disagreed with Soviet policies. So that is a, has a long, long trend. It also didn't begin in 2014 because it began, the new wave of this kind of vilification began after the Orange Revolution. This is when Putin did his first turn to the right in 2000, from 2005 onwards, and this uh, declining and negative viewpoints of Ukrainians in the Russian media began to begin in that period, from 2005 through to 2012. It changed a bit under Yanukovych um, after 2010, but not to a, a massive degree. From, of course, from 2014, um, Russians had already come used to calling Ukrainians what the, you know, fascists in very negative terms, and very ethnically based viewpoints of Ukrainians very chauvinistic, very colonial, uh, this very deep viewpoint that Ukraine is an artificial state. Putin already said this in 2008 at the NATO Congress in Bucharest. Ukraine is artificial, that Eastern and Southern Ukraine were wrongly included in the Ukrainian state. 2008, not 2014. Um, and this is a very much linked to the growing Russian identity of the Great Patriotic War, which in turn is linked to re-Stalinization in Russia the opposite of Ukraine, where you have de-Stalinization going for 30 years now. Um, the difference between this sort of ethnic color of uh, nationalist viewpoint of Ukraine and Ukraine is that in Ukraine, it's civic nationalism, as we've heard before. How is that sh shown? Well, in opinion polls in Ukraine, 80%, 75, 80% of Ukrainians have a very negative view of Putin, the Russian government, State Duma. Only 25% of Ukrainians have a negative view of the Russian people. That is an example of civic nationalism or patriotism, not ethnic nationalism. This, of course, um, Russia's position in terms of information war, uh, military aggression, has completely backfired. We've heard this on many panels. Uh, Russian influence today is far less than it used to be in Ukraine. Russia's ability to use soft power has declined, although I'm surprised in none of the previous panels except one was the issue of the church come up, the Russian Orthodox Church. Films, TV channels, books, social media have been banned. Um, I was working in the Ukrainian parliament last year for USAID, and I was surprised to see how many people now use Google, Gmail. A few years ago, a lot of people used .ru, but that's been banned, so now Google moved in in a big way. Good. Um, they obviously saw an opportunity, saw a vacuum. What about in the West? Well, it, this is the period since 2014 has seen the greatest number of publications on contemporary Ukraine since ever. In here, I have a bibliography of about 300 published since 2014 in academia and think tanks. Since this was published a year ago, there's been about another 100, another 70, 80. So that's nearly 400 published. It's a huge number of publications. The problem we have is that the majority of the scholars who have written these have never visited Ukraine, and especially they've never visited the front line. 
Very few of them, if any, used Ukrainian sources, even Russian sources. There's no excuse, because the Ukrainian government, president, and parliamentary websites have Ukrainian and Russian pages, but they don't use them. So they cite Putin a lot, but they don't cite Poroshenko hardly. That, of course, you also, that translates into what I would say is, from a negative viewpoint, which, which, we, which we have, we have amongst Western scholars and some journalists, I would call them Putinophiles, especially on the left. These are sort of very, they draw upon their anti-Americanism, so Putin is the best sort of defender against the rise of America. Ironically, their allies are on the center-right realists, so Trump is a big fan. Uh, the left, the, the Western left, who like Putin, love Trump, which is very weird. Um, then you have Russell-centric viewpoints, which is something that the government of Ukraine could easily counter, but it doesn't. This is where you should put the map up. Oh. Can you put the map? Yeah, if we could uh, ask for the map that uh, Tadis has. Yeah. Um, there it is. Yeah, and this is a great map to sh to sh that the government of Ukraine could use. It doesn't use this argument, but it's a great argument to use to counter the idea that it's a civil war. Because the majority of military casualties are Russian-speaking Eastern and Southern Ukrainians. You'll see the largest number of casualties are in Dnipro, Sergei Ploky's ho former homeland, um, next to Donbass, 432. These are all different security forces in Ukraine. So Putin's claim that he moved into Ukraine to protect Russian speakers is completely undermined by this map because it's actually Russian speakers who are on the front line fighting against Putin. Plus Ukraine speakers, of course. Um, a third, one, a third, one minute, Taras. What? One minute, yes. Oh, yes. Um, a, a third group is the, the unwillingness of some in the West to... Um, I can have three extra points like this. <laughs> Make it quick. Um, a, third, a third potential problematical group is, is seen in the unwillingness of some in the West to compare and place on the same level Nazi and Soviet crimes. And you saw that in the criticism in the West of the decommunization laws. Um, to what degree um, is, has this had an impact? Well, um, I think that we shouldn't overestimate things like Russia today. It has an impact, particularly in some places where you, you will always have people who support that kind of conspiracy theory. You're not really gonna convince those people. Um, but, and in places like Britain, where you have a strong media presence, like the BBC, Russia today has no ability to compete. But in, but in such uh, areas like uh, close elections, like the US elections in 2016, or in referendums like Brexit or the Scottish referendum, which are very close, Russian interference can swing it, because it only needs a few points. Final note on Ukrainian government issues. The Ukrainian government throughout the last nearly 30 years of independence has never been very good at PR in the West, at doing information work in the West, um, for all sorts of reasons we can go into. Um, it's never been really a priority. This is surprising because it's not really expensive. Also, um, it's very easy to, in many ways to counter with real truthful information the Russian narrative. Um, but you need to bring in Ukrainian and Western experts into this. And there seems to be a reluctance on the Ukrainian government side to do that. For example, I live currently 10 minutes walk from the International Court of Justice, where Ukrainians fighting Russia over, the, uh, over a case. I offered to give my services free of charge. Ukrainian government wasn't interested. And this is typical, sadly. Um, I don't know why that is, but it's typical. Um, I think that there is a need for... Ukrainian government to reach out. There are many people in the West, both of Ukraine diaspora, non-diaspora, yes. who could help, many experts in Ukraine, but there needs, this needs to be a concerted effort. Um, we did talk about it with Andrei Milosevic from Kiev Mahila to, to organize some kind of consortium at Kiev Mahila. Could we kind of bring it to a place? Because place. fake news originated there. Um, but Media visits, we need to bring people to Ukraine, media groups, I'm finishing, media groups, take them to the front line, get them to see that the Russian speakers are fighting on the front line, get them to visit Odessa, Kharkiv, and talk to people there. Um, interview volunteers, particularly one area which is never really covered in the Western media is the whole volunteer movement in Ukraine, 
which is primarily driven by women, which is a very fascinating area, and many of those are, again, Russian speakers. So, and to counter propaganda and, I would say, ideologically driven academia. On that, I'll, I'll finish there. Well, thank you for extremely wide-ranging uh, comments, which have served to sum up many of the themes of the conference. The, at the time of the, the cutting edge of technology is being used in information warfare, we are seeing some very old narratives indeed. Now, this will be the last opportunity uh, for people in the audience to, uh, to speak. Uh, and we, please keep it brief so that as many as possible can do so. For 10 minutes, we're going to collect questions, and then each member of the panel will have a minute each uh, to make a final point. So, hands in the air, please. First. Uh, yeah, Minister, Estonia has got 1.1, 1.2 million people, but have lustrated more people than Ukraine. And you have a problem with experts. Can you sort of link that as to why you've got so few lustrations? Okay, thank you. Next question, please. Paweł Purski, Izbok EU. East Book EU, Paweł Kurski. My question concerns how to understand hybrid warfare. The Western countries uh, use a concept of hybrid war which is different from what Russia is using. If we uh, read Russian literature on uh, conducting this kind of conflict, uh, there is the concept of a small war. So what is the difference between the Russian understanding and the Western understanding of hybrid war? And a question to all of you. What is the role of these historical narratives and how to oppose the development of this uh, historical uh, narrative as part of um, hybrid warfare? Дякую. Я хотіла подякувати за прекрасні презентації, а свою ремарку спрямувати до пані Катерини Крук, яка доповідь. Thank you. Я хотів би звернутися до пані Крук. Інні виступлення були свідні. All the statements were very good, but I was especially um, amazed uh, and impressed by the presentation by Katarina Kruk. Uh, concerning the methods of uh, conducting uh, this war, Ukrainian uh, politicians apply means uh, previously used by others like uh, the Russian uh, propaganda, including fake news. Let me note that Russian propaganda has at least a hundred years history. And this phenomenon is uh, spreading uh, not only over our part of Europe, but they are very active in Central and Eastern Europe, especially including Poland, where these methods are used. Uh, and uh, what you told us in, is an excellent research base, analytical base, but we need to understand what is going on in our countries and how this uh, populistic wave affects society, that uh, it um, generates a need for populism in society. The question to Mr. Bidenka. Uh, already for four years uh, your ministry exists, uh, so can you tell us briefly about five achievements uh, and five targets in the mid, uh, medium term of your activities. 
Well, I don't know to whom address this question to Arte Maria or Katarina. Are there any plans concerning education, training people in Ukraine? For example, you get an email from the Ministry of Agriculture and the address is ended with uh, dot .u. Uh, the RU email is not used anymore, but there are others. Uh, I have a question uh, to Artem, to Artem Bidenko. Is your ministry using uh, the similar means uh, as Russia to oppose uh, the uh, cyber attacks, the information warfare? And the second philosophical question, whether democratic countries which respect uh, democracy are doomed to fail in opposing uh, Russian fake news. Uh, because perhaps uh, what Russia disseminates is more attractive than what we offer, so that fake news are more uh, attractive uh, than uh, what uh, is uh, provided by journalists observing uh, traditional ethics. How does this affect the uh, development of democracy in the affected countries? Does it uh, imply that uh, democracy is doomed to lose against uh, fake news and disinformation from Russia? Well, this is not a philosophical, it's a very practical question. Well, it's very, ve very well that Ukraine has control of its uh, media space, uh, but uh, fake news and disinformation, which is, is disseminated also through social media and videos on YouTube. You probably know these examples. Uh, this disinformation is uh, disseminated daily in uh, uh, in the media, and um, often uh, they have a greater audience than uh, the mainstream television. So how can this be counteracted against? As briefly as they can. Uh, starting, please, with the minister, and then uh, in the order in which they are seated. Uh, minister. Thank you. Not minister, but state secretary. <laughs> Ну, не вийде коротко, але я дуже спробую. Спочатку трошки контексту в рамках першого запитання. Well, we would all wish to be able to give straightforward answers. If Georgia is able to do it, we also can. But Ukraine, economically and socially, is very complex, and its history is also complicated. So. Uh, issues of uh, vetting, of, of uh, eliminating uh, collaborators, agents, is more difficult. Uh, we have uh, different people in terms of their status, their education, their social position. Ukraine is not a uniform country. Even the language uh, divides us and uh, not into uh, Ukrainian and Russian speakers, but also uh, whether they speak Ukrainian only or both languages. There are very combi uh, many combinations, and it's hard to pick any one of them. If we adopt a single solution, 
uh, we will have uh, half of the population in favor and others against. It's hard to uh, find uh, people for the ministry, a finance person to manage our finance, for example. Over four years, I have changed uh, four times the financial officer. It's also hard to follow our legislation and experts. Ukrainian law doesn't allow to finance experts from outside of the ministry, so we seek grants and different solutions. We try to uh, discuss these problems with the Ministry of Finance, but they say that this might lead to corruption, that uh, government money might be used uh, for um, expert tourism. So we believe that the ministry should determine the standards and priorities uh, of the work. Uh, our approach at the ministry to information policy is such that if we start implementing it with our own hands and not through uh, voluntary organizations, uh, we uh, will uh, steer from democracy to an authoritarian state and telling the media what they are to do. We are a small group which determines uh, the direction, uh, the orientation, uh, whether uh, some uh, websites uh, should be closed or forbidden. We won't do that, though. Uh, only um, uh, the courts uh, may rule on what is forbidden and what is not. And so we need uh, experts uh, to consult uh, the judges. And we want to uh, provide examples of NGOs which are credible and support them. We want to uh, establish uh, an institute of government grants. Uh, today we have developed uh, mechanisms uh, to support media and uh, social networks. How can we do it? We can't pay the experts uh, for foreign travel, but we can help them publish books. Um, and this is not corruption. Uh, we have uh, four key priorities. The first one, that's television. Uh, in the east of Ukraine, an, an infrastructure to, bro to broadcast uh, true information and also a renewal of the press. Uh, in the east, we even provide uh, free uh, newspapers and um, information about uh, Ukraine. Uh, we don't even have a brand. Uh, there is a committee which talks about it, and uh, we are uh, approaching the understanding of what communications model we uh, are going to apply. Uh, but we are still developing the visual aspects uh, of the program, uh, which uh, should soon be realized. We'll be buying a media time abroad uh, to uh, publicize Ukraine uh, internationally. And uh, also internal PR, working with regions, popularizing reforms. So government uh, relations are important here. And the development of information society, uh, uh, talking about hybrid warfare, how to counteract it. And education. Uh, the position of government is that no instruments uh, based on prohibition uh, are ineffective. Uh, the population needs to be educated, and especially uh, civil servants, which shouldn't uh, use um, uh, dot .ru addresses, and we should uh, work uh, with um, citizens organizing courses, uh, free of charge, uh, teaching how to uh, prevent fake news and propaganda. Uh, 
Indeed, uh, we ought to uh, fight Russian propaganda, and it's easier when we have a majority in parliament and deputies who are able uh, to draft laws blocking Russian propaganda and Russian hybrid war. But what is crucial is to develop a strong alternative to Russian media products. And that's our tasks as uh, media producers. Whether these are uh, programs on uh, culture like Arte or BBC, uh, documentary materials based on ar open archives, uh, cultural magazines, all this is important because we are a different nation than Russians. We have a society which is oriented uh, to uh, the civilized world and not a totalitarian state. Otherwise, we lose our youth uh, who don't want to view Russian programs uh, or um, uh, Ukrainian information programs. They are interested in new technologies like Snapchat. So it's important also uh, that over the past two days I've had the opportunity to listen uh, to your views and uh, we heard that in order to overcome the external enemy we should focus on our internal uh, problems and stabilize them. Well, what's the difference uh, between hybrid war in the Western and uh, our uh, Eastern perception. Uh, Ukraine and Russia have uh, changed the notion of hybrid uh, war. Until 2014, it was uh, viewed as a uh, conflict between societies at different stages of development. But our example is uh, the uh, opposition of two different uh, post-Soviet states. Russia and Ukraine are fighting for dominance uh, in uh, the post-Soviet uh, area. Therefore, for Russia, the existence of a democratic state uh, in the post-Soviet zone is very dangerous. After four years, our government, rightly or wrongly, is improving uh, on its previous uh, performance, doing things it didn't do in the past uh, 20 years. Uh, in the case of historical narrative, uh, comparing Ukraine and Poland, Poland developed it, uh, its narrative uh, in the early 90s. In Ukraine, this wasn't uh, done and we've talked a lot about it today. So until we have a clear historical narrative in Ukraine, uh, uh, the attitude of Poles to the Home Army and the attitude of Ukrainians to the UPA. Uh, if we don't have an adequate uh, narrative, we will be uh, on a weaker position. So the defense of uh, the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine prohibited the use of Russian email, and many said that this was undemocratic because uh, this could be circumvented easily. But uh, today, the Russian social media uh, have dropped out of the ten most uh, popular websites uh, in uh, Ukraine. So uh, the point is uh, that uh, in authoritarian states uh, take uh, decisions uh, prompter and that's uh, an advantage on the side of Russia in this conflict. And uh, for the democratic world, this is a, a major challenge. Not only Ukraine, but other democratic countries ought to address uh, the message uh, to society in a modern packaging, like computer games, clips, uh, 
etc. Uh, the information should be packed uh, in uh, uh, the newest, smartest media. People who actively used Twitter uh, are very precise, and I will try to be like the same. Now, regarding Yevgen's thesis on the ban of uh, Russian websites, I know that there are Ukrainian students in Natalin or um, from other universities, and they are also watching us in the live stream on YouTube. Well, you know, most of us in Ukraine uh, have very good command of Russian, and often you need to uh, take advantage of that and enter Russian websites to uh, read their draft laws, for example. There is this draft uh, of Yarova, and all, all the websites that have been registered to spread disinformation are obliged to report to FSB data and information concerning the IP addresses and the email addresses and actual names uh, all uh, of both mail.ru and all the other social web media. They're all registered, uh, so they are obliged to report all your personal data to FSB. So going back to the educational issues, you need to start from simple matters. I don't think that uh, our informational campaign was very well thought through that explained the decision on the decree on um, about banning the Russian website. If you uh, see, enter and see what uh, information should be reported to FSB, you will understand why Ukrainian authority have taken this step. Indeed, uh, it is very sad to be looking at all this, and it's quite painful because uh, it's an issue of political accountability. And when we have information attacks, information warfare on the, of the highest level, well, we also have them on the lowest level. Unless Ukraine politicians understand that the warfare cannot be won uh, against our opponent at this point, and if they can continue the services of uh, troll groups on Facebook. I used to work with the Ukrainian <coughs> government, and when I did, there was a group of reformers who wanted to do good things uh, in Ukraine. And at the time, we saw many times that when uh, discussions began on reforms uh, and new decisions of our team uh, became apparent, after a few minutes, you were able to see which narrative was being used. And people who use communication, they see when the attack begins. Unfortunately, last year, when uh, there was an attack on our ministry, it started from a website that were from websites that were rela related to Medvedchuk. So a question to Ukrainian politicians, um, instead of promoting their partisan slogans, they should appeal for a political fight. And we appeal to them not to be short-sighted, not to only look in the short-term perspective of the nearest elections, because this is what leads to the situation that we have. People no longer know who to trust. It's not a question of uh, read which uh, media I'm reading. I can trust no one, and lo lo losing confidence is a basic thing. This is where societies start disintegrating. Unless we can trust one another, um, unless we have mutual trust and uh, confidence in uh, authorities, how can we support and uphold our state. It's a question to politicians, but it's also a question of accountability of our journalists. We spoke to Jaroslav Hrycak about this yesterday. Um, Ukraine is on the right path, but if we look at our mass media, they talk about either treason or victory. Uh, not to mention the expert. The term expert is very negatively viewed in uh, Ukraine. We should take our work responsibly. We should be communicating objective facts and uh, discuss objectively instead of fighting for popularity. We're all on the same boat. Really, which is not only for Ukrainians, but about Ukrainians. And I think you're both scared of that. That's what you're 
It was like, I'm continuing the tradition of Miss Oksana Zabushko. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was, everyone was scared of her and everyone now is scared of me. You said that volunteering movement was supported and brought up by Ukrainian women. So, exactly. So the gender equality is really very strong in Ukraine. So about education, and I would like very briefly to speak about the Kyiv Mohila Academy, who actually gave Stop Fake to the world. And a few weeks ago, we launched it's a new a project. Wonderful institution, but please. Exactly. So with education, uh, for every single person who would like to make their colleagues or friends more aware of the threats of the informational warfare. And I do speak a lot with military people and with politicians with different, in different Western countries. And I always tell that it's not enough to say that there is informational warfare and Russia is a perpetrator. You always have to think about on your, your own people and giving them instruments. And giving them instruments is first of all awareness, because if you aren't aware that there is information warfare going on and someone is playing against you with, with information on informational space, then you can't protect yourself. Yourself. And another thing is that this critical thinking, but also uh, taking the example of stop fake, working with people on different levels. Stop fake started as online uh, initiative, collecting information and proving the cases of fake news. Then they went on YouTube. They started um, recording stop fake digest, news digest in English and in Russian. Then they started producing newspapers which were disseminated in, in, West, in Eastern Ukraine and Crimea. And the, last, uh, and the last effort that actually was started, and I was really very proud to be invited to that, and we started the TV program for Ukraine. Because in Ukraine, television is the strongest channel of information. Therefore, there is a need to reach out to people of uh, different information um, information habits. Some people take information from internet, some from newspapers, some from TV. Thank you. Very briefest of last words from Taras Kuzha. You're not scared of me. <laughs> Brief. Um, yes, all I really, really will talk about is, I think, one, one example of where I think um, the, the information policies of Ukraine uh, are missing. And this is where um, new, potentially radical changes in Ukraine are not uh, briefed to the Western world enough in advance. And therefore, it's kind of just, it happens, and then there's a big shock in the West, and there's no real Ukrainian information policy to explain these things. And I'll, I'll give you an example. For example, uh, the language question. We've heard about this this morning. Mikola Rabchuk made some very good comments that the, uh, in the last panel that the idea that somehow Ukraine is sort of this extreme example is completely ridiculous. If we, anybody knows uh, European policies towards nationalities, they'll see that. Even including multicultural Canada, um, the, the new law states that 50% of TV and radio should be in Ukrainian. Wow, big shock. Well, actually, it's more liberal than Canada. Uh, in Quebec, you have to have two-thirds in French. So, I mean, and there are countless examples of this that you could uh, retort back. But you need to do the work. You need diplomats in the West to, to do work. You need to write opinion pieces in newspaper articles by the president or the government leaders. You need to uh, get government people in Kiev to talk to journalists, talk to uh, embassy diplomats. You need to be active, um, and that unfortunately is not. So the question of other issues, for example, which is just a quick list of themes, that there is no civil war in Ukraine between Russian and Ukraine speakers. I explained how easy it is to counter this, but this is a very common narrative you hear in the West, um, and it's a common narrative pushed by Russia all the time, because it's a way of hiding the fact that they're involved in the war. If it's a civil war, then Russia's not involved. Um, it's just a, it's a problem between Ukrainian and Russian speakers. Um, the banning of, the Rus of Russian social media was never explained in the West why this had to happen and, and why, for example, the contact has been controlled by the Kremlin since February 2014. Um, I mean, it's taken over. The, uh, the original managers were pushed out. Uh, the decommunization laws, why, is, why that re should have not been prepared more better as well? Um, because what Ukraine did was nothing different, as Andrei Kohut will say, will explain, I'm sure will back me up, nothing different to what was done in other countries in the 1990s in Central Eastern Europe and the Baltic states. Um, also issues, um, there are many positive things that Ukraine could do to promote that it's not doing. The women volunteers is one incredible story of women volunteers in Ukraine working for the last four years. 
uh, putting their lives on the line when they travel to the front line. I went to the front line with women volunteers, uh, and they go on a regular basis to deliver supplies to Ukraine troops. Incredible story, but it doesn't really get out there very much. And of course, the issues of comparing Ukraine's already now three decades long decommunization, de-Stalinization, I should say, compared to re-Stalinization in Russia and why it was that Ukraine moved from the narrative of great patriotic war to, celebrate, to celebrating the end of World War II, i.e. 1939 to 45, not 1941 to 45. These are very, very important issues which show, which can be promoted, but which are unfortunately are not. Thank you very much to all of our panelists for such a stimulating discussion and for making such efforts to be brief. <laughs> now, I'm going to invite Professor Georges Mink to come up to the stage to say a few words to sum up the conference. He's going to say a few words of thanks as well, but uh, before he does that, I'd first of all like to extend our thanks uh, to His Excellency the Ambassador of Ukraine, Andriy Deshchitsa, and all his colleagues at the Ukrainian Embassy for the support they have given this project. Now, putting... Putting on an event of this scale requires the mobilization of enormous resources. Now, although she's not in the room at the moment, I'd like to express our gratitude to the Vice Rector for taking that risk and taking on that responsibility. And a very large number of people have come together, far too many for me to uh, name them all, uh, who under the leadership of Pavel Koval and Georges Mink have put this into reality. So thank you to everyone who's taken part. Uh, all those who have taken part in this conference as guests and those who have worked so hard to put it on. And... Last but not least, I would like to say a particular thank you to Georges Mink. Uh, as the co-head of this project, he has produced that sociological and political science uh, uh, expertise, which has refined the questions to be asked, uh, which has provided that input at a uh, key moment, uh, and his persistence has paid off uh, with some of the guests that have been invited here. That's only a small fraction of the work that he's put into this project and this conference. So thank you, Georges. Uh, un grand merci pour toi. Merci pour ces paroles que je n'ai pas méritées. Shanovna Pani Rector. Dear Ms. Rector, Minister, Excellencies, Dear colleagues and friends, certainly to talk about the whole conference is impossible. It would probably be very chaotic. Uh, let me this time begin rather than end, as I did in my introductory note to the previous conference with the, world, with the words quoted by a French uh, Nobel Prize uh, winner, Albert Camus. Uh, to badly name things is to add to the wrong of the world. Uh, if you name things or phenomena or events wrongly, that means you increase uh, the uh, sorrow uh, of the world. Uh, our generals have started, have tried to help us, uh, but uh, our uh, the topic has not been exhausted. Who are the separatists? Who are the green people that violate the territory of Ukraine? Are they other Ukrainians? Are they other Russians? Or are they just uh, servants, Russian servants to uh, Putin's imperialism? Uh, we are aware uh, that in Syria, to bypass the Afghan syndrome, of soldiers' mothers demanding their sons' coffins, the Wagner Group is used. Um, uh, young, intelligent Ukrainians who went to the battlefield risking their lives have demonstrated to us what patriotism is all about. 
which I would call a melancholic patriotism. And uh, for their simple words and the description of this phenomenon uh, by a bold uh, frontline journalist, we owe our admiration. The situation in Donbass, but everywhere else where Putin is playing with matches uh, and creating frozen conflicts, can be described as a paradox. Uh, and the formulation goes back to the beginning of the Cold War by Raymond Arnold. Uh, the impossible, impossible uh, war and improbable peace. Um, this could be one of the thoughts for the nearest future. What is the Ukrainian army missing to uh, recover the lost contested territories? Why is Putin being left with the initiative uh, to test the strength and the will of his opponents? How to control the war hybrid, the hybrid war? where disinformation, uh, trolls, uh, uh, influence agents are only the Russia's tools financed by um, a former chef in Kre Kremlin and some other people from uh, Putin's uh, circles. We've had the great opportunity to meet uh, Pre President Hollande, who said that Russia can be stopped only with one lethal blow by boycotting its uh, gas and uh, oil offer. And here we could use some actual real solidarity in the European Union. Whether his successors think the same, we uh, don't know. And nobody has mentioned that there is a Gerhard Schroeder. Prime Minister Yatenyuk with cold blood described the weakness of the West and he wants to believe the Washington format more than the Normandy format. But Ambassador Fried uh, was more nuanced. Uh, all new formats are needed. The Minsk uh, process has given us time to modernize the army and has allowed us to consolidate the new hard Ukrainian identity of a youthful nation in, the pro in its process of nation building. Archbishop Chevchuk um, has demonstrated how important the spiritual organic work is on reconstructing, reconstructing ethics in the capital of confidence. And the first primary institution that this depends on is the family. In concluding my random remarks, let me reiterate the question, what is today's situation and who are we dealing with? In the seventh century BC, uh, Homer, the Greek poet, describes described war in an interesting way um, by using the mythology of two types of uh, commanders and strategies, Achilles, uh, who fights with his strength, with a soldier's honor as um, a profound value, and Ulysses, uh, the protagonist of uh, scheming and uh, a French geopolitician thinks that the whole history of strategy is founded on this types, these two types in the Western world and definitely Ukraine is part of it. Putin who shrewdly uh, plays his partners against each other and uh, coerces them into wit into revealing their weaknesses, building his grotesque charisma that undoubtedly responds to the need of a large proportion of the Russian population who are fascinated in bathing in ice cold water or hugging the tiger or marching um, across the golden rooms of the Kremlin. Uh, well, that is an expression of extreme shrewdness supported with nuclear weapons. But we would much rather prefer uh, and the friendly Ulysses than, uh, than Putin. Today, the challenge, not just for scholars who build paradigms, who try to explain, uh, but mainly for the nations that are under his control and that should enjoy the freedom of choice, like all nations do, who, uh, which aspire to, for, aspire to self define and to manage their own territory. It's a good thing that our conference, an important step 
in our research about the three revolutions is being held here in Poland, in a place that is so European. It is perhaps also useful for the Polish-Ukrainian relations, because until recently, Poland uh, was an ally, an advocate of the Ukrainian matter, no questions asked. And today, this image is not such an idyllic one. Perhaps uh, due to too much of hindsight instead of foresight. Um, and our research has been enriched thanks to the second conference and thanks to your presence. We can plan f uh, subsequent conferences and uh, continue our research. And we would like to invite you at this point to participate in those. This is a collective uh, effort. And I am sure that Pavel Koval, Koval will uh, enumerate every member of our team. Uh, and uh, as a co-contributor, for uh, the research uh, that is exceptional in uh, global scale. I would like to thank two people, uh, Rector Eva Osniecka kametska who has uh, hosted us here, and given uh, haven to this original unique project uh, and has demonstrated how important goodwill is both for science and the European ideal. And I'd like to thank Pavel Koval. I know that he doesn't like that uh, very much, but without him, this project would not exist. His um, uh, affiliation to Ukraine is well known. Nobody has the same aura, the same uh, associations uh, as him. Uh, Don Quixote uh, fighting uh, windmills. Uh, a lot has been said about such characters during this conference. Um, so let's uh, let's thank again these two people. And on a personal note, I'd like to thank my colleagues, especially Richard Butterwick Pavlikovsky, with whom I have cooperated. And now we will screen the film. <laughs>